Hi everyone. Welcome to the launch of the University of Queensland and the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, also called IATSIS, in conversation. What's core to organisational cultural learning? That's why we're all here today, or if you're watching the video later. I want to begin our session this time with acknowledging the country that I'm on here in Brisbane, the Yugger and Turrbal lands of the greater Mianjin Valley, Brisbane Valley, um, and also the country that uh, Craig and his team are on today, the Ngunnawal uh, peoples. And wherever the country you are that you're sitting and watching this today, or also watching the video later after the transmission today, I recognise that even as the, the broadband cuts across and the waves cut across, that it's cutting across the country of this land um, and country that has always been Aboriginal land or Torres Strait Islander islands to the north. We pay our respects to elders past and also those that are with us today. Well, today we have a, a really big session for you in terms of conversation you are going to be participating along the way too the first thing i need you to do is to write down if you know where you are uh, in terms of the country of the peoples where you are is to put that into the chat function for for us here so we know where we have people today so i'd like you to do that while you're doing that i want to let you know that i am bronwyn fredericks the pro vice chancellor indigenous engagement at university of queensland with me today, on my left, um, I have Professor Debbie Terry, the uh, Professor and Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Queensland. And on Zoom, on another site, is Craig Ritchie, who's the CEO of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, also referred to as AATSIS. A little bit about both of these two brilliant individuals now. Debbie, prior to commencing this role in August 2020, so Debbie's only just newly come back to UQ, she served as the Vice-Chancellor for Curtin University in Western Australia and was in that position from 2014 until 2020 when she came across from the West to, to University of Queensland. She was made an officer in the General Division of the Order of Australia in June 2015 in recognition of her service to education, to the higher education sector. Debbie is also the chair of the board of Universities Australia. For people who aren't aware of that, it's the peak body that represents all universities in Australia. A fellow and past president of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, and an appointed member of the Australian Research Council Advisory Council, and serves on the Australia and New Zealand School of Government Board and Australia's Academic Research Network Board. She's now at UQ, having started here in 1990 and working her way from being a scholar in psychology during that 24 years through a range of leadership roles, um, right to now coming back. And we welcome you back, Debbie, and I know you're still getting around to other parts of the university, um, reacquainting yourself with people again and touching base and also seeing what's changed since you left in 2014. Joining us from Ngunnawal country and Canberra is Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, Mr Craig Ritchie. Craig is a Dungadi man and whilst he's been at AATSIS um, since around 2017 as the CEO, his career spans senior roles including working and heading up Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander education, university access and participation for people from low socioeconomic backgrounds and international student mobility. He was also founding director Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health in the ACT government. And he went on to serve as the CEO of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. And I think that's where I first met Craig or maybe sometime before that um, as the chair of NACHO and the Chair of Wenunga, Nimit Yacha, Aboriginal Health and Community Services. I think it is through Craig's work, as I said, that I, I met him in health and um, when I was working in health at that time. A little bit before we begin the conversation in terms of uh, housekeeping, if you have questions, um, which we will have some time for questions at the end, 
I want you to put them in the questions and answers function, a Q&A function, and we will endeavour to get to as many of those as we can. So just be aware we may not get to all of them. There might be lots, but uh, we'll do the best we can in this time. So welcome, Debbie and Craig, and I'm really pleased that you could both join me here uh, this afternoon to talk about this core learning Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Learning Foundation course that we have available for all of the staff here at the University of Queensland. The course has now been available for over one week and we're already starting to see staff engaging with the course, which is terrific. I've had staff just today ask me what is the free gift they're going to get if they do all the modules. So just keep that in mind that there is a gift if you do all of the modules. Um, and people who are new to the, to the modules, we're going to see a short video now. Welcome, Welcome to, to CORE. CORE, your introduction to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. I'm Casey. And I'm John Paul, and we'll be your guides on this journey. This course aims to build on your own experience to deepen your understanding of the diverse contexts of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander societies. The modules are packed with information, ideas and activities, and you will hear and see some great audio and visual content. It's a, it's a mode of thinking and a set of assumptions that frames Aboriginal identity. When we say of oh, Aboriginal culture, we're talking about our way of living and all the things that our old people said were important. course is not trying to teach you everything but rather encourage you to be open to learn more. This is your first step on a lifelong journey in strengthening your connection and working relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. first time that that's already started to inspire you and encourage you to go ahead and click online later and have a look at the modules and the training that is available to you as a staff member of the University of Queensland. UQ is not the first organisation that's got this core learning training and having that available to all employees. There has been a number of other universities and organisations who already embrace this and we have the benefit of learning from them and fixing this in terms of really tailoring it to the University of Queensland here, what we want and the way that we want it going forward. Craig, um, knowing that IATSIS is a peak Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research organisation in Australia, a leader in its field, not just in Australia, but also I would actually say in the world, what inspired or simulated, uh, um, stimulated IATSIS to develop the training? Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, uh, I do live and work on Ngunnawal country and I want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people. Um, I have tried to switch my camera on. There, there we go. However, um, I am... Uh, uh, so I want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people uh, where I live and work. However, today I'm coming to you from Gadigal land in Sydney. I've had to travel up for... An event yesterday, so um, uh, I want to acknowledge the the, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose country I'm on today. So you asked what stimulated us. Well, I I think that um, we live in a time when sort of the days of uh, hopeful and well-meaning um, efforts to to uh, engage with Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are over, and there is a real 
strong demand for people, uh, organisations and institutions to be able to function in a culturally competent way. And as you saw, we partnered with a number of organisations primarily to uh, develop this course for uh, use in the Australian Public Service. There was nothing uh, of any uh, consistent, standardised, rigorous uh, material available for Australian public servants uh, to be able to use uh, as part of developing their professional competence in the, in the various roles that they had. And uh, so we sought, uh, in partnership with, uh, with the Department, of, then Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and Social Services, to develop a, a, a course that would enable or would support better cultural competence by Australian public servants. Um, and this is the core uh, course. It's, um, and of course, because of being who we are at IATSIS, we're very committed to uh, accessibility of information and rigorous scholarship. And so the core uh, foundation course that you all now have access to, I think is one of the best, if not the best in the field, uh, uh, of cultural competence foundation uh, programs. Thanks, Craig. And um, certainly, I encourage you. Craig is the CEO. Thousands and thousands of people already, and we're we're really excited to have it here. Craig said it's a foundation. Um, training and course. It doesn't stop here, but the people can keep going. Debbie and Craig, you've both been long-term advocates and leaders in building organisational, not just change, but cultural capability. And I'd like to have a bit of an open dialogue here now on your experiences around um, with the drivers of building organisational cultural capability. And based on your experience, what are the things that drive organisations um, to build cultural capability within its staff base and within its organisation? And we'll, we'll go to you, Debbie, first. Thank you very much, Bronwyn, and thank you very much for your warm introduction earlier. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in, in the launch of this core cultural learning program. And thank you, Craig, for your our leadership of this very, very important program. And uh, I certainly do want to acknowledge that here. And we're obviously delighted now to be rolling out uh, the core program uh, throughout our institution. But before I respond to the question, can I please also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge uh, their deep cultural uh, and spiritual connections to all of our lands here in Australia as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. Now, I've, I've made a personal decision to always do an Indigenous acknowledgement before speaking publicly. And that's important for me for two reasons. One, it really is about respect. And my strong view is that if we are to build cultural awareness and understanding within it, within any organisation, you have to have a foundation of respect. It's absolutely critical that, that we have that foundation because when we've got that foundation, uh, what we do is cre create the space where our colleagues, all of our broad communities, want to learn more about the unique history, culture and knowledge of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So this is, this is absolutely critical respect but also leadership is, 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 is also critically important. And I, when I talk about leadership, I'm talking about leadership at all levels of our organisations. But I'm conscious as a leader of this university that my behaviour and my example counts. It's about sending the right signals so that others will also feel empowered uh, to uh, go in the same direction. But leadership needs to be supported by practical programs and activities that really do drive individuals to change their behaviour or their mindset or to build that understanding. Obviously, that's why we have a reconciliation action plan. It is actually all about action. It's about holding ourselves, each of us, all of us to account so that we follow through on the actions that will guide us towards reconciliation and as a consequence, a stronger, fairer 
better Australia. So I'm delighted with the launch of this core cultural learning program. It means that we are really progressing towards fulfilling one of the many commitments that we've made in our wrap. Um, over to you, Craig, around um, your experience of things that drive organisations to build and continue to build cultural capability. The, the new national anthem is you're on mute, Craig, um, or on your mute, whoever you are. Sorry about that. Thank you for that. And, and uh, Debbie, thanks for those, those remarks. And I want to begin by just referring to the issue that you mentioned, and that is the question of leadership. Uh, so in our experience, um, uh, leadership is critical, a critical driver for organisations uh, moving towards growing cultural competence. Um, and and uh, as, as you just said, Deb, uh, the role of leaders in setting a standard and so setting a standard of behaviour, but also creating an environment where uh, there's not just a standard, but there's the means by which that can be obtained. So, so for us, leadership is a critical driver um, in terms of greater cultural competence. Um, look, I also want to point to the issue of um, the, the fairly sort of basic um, idea that cultural competence is critical uh, uh, as part of a business imperative. Uh, we live in a world now that's much less, uh, notwithstanding the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we live in a world that's globally connected. Uh, people tend not to um, be as, how shall I put it, locally kind of constrained as perhaps they might have once been. And uh, indeed, many universities have campuses, not just uh, uh, where their, if you like, headquarters is, uh, but in lots of different places. And so as an actual business imperative uh, to, to people having a greater ability to engage in respectful ways and informed ways across cultural um, uh, divisions and cultural distinctions. Uh, uh, I'm kind of driven by um, what might, many people might consider a culturalist point of view, and it's summed up in the words of uh, uh, an academic from the West University of Western Sydney, uh, where he said, culture is always there and it's there first. And so given that that's true, um, it's absolutely important to the effectiveness of our organisations that we have people working in our institutions who are, uh, are equipped and able to uh, engage across those cultural uh, distinctions in ways that are respectful and important. So, so leadership and the business and, and having a clear link to business imperative um, is uh, are two critical drivers for uh, driving cultural competence in organisations. I really like that you brought in that business element there, um, Craig, and what is good for business. And I'm going to just move to, to that and ask Debbie the same. And we've heard from the business world from you, Craig, and your perspectives. And it'd be good to hear from you, Debbie, in terms of business in Australia, but business in the university as well, maybe bring it mm. down to for the staff out there online mm. um, and then translating that from the staff and we can look back to what Craig had said. Yeah, no, I think at, 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 at the broadest level, we all know, and it's well documented, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have inhabited this continent for over 60,000 years. So over that time, Indigenous Australians have developed unique knowledge systems, insights and beliefs about how to connect with this land and how to live on this continent and how to sustain this continent uh, into the future. And that knowledge remains highly relevant and vital to how we all live here today. So it's at that very high level that ensuring our community has an improved understanding of our Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander history and culture. Then we take it to another point, as I said before, is really a precondition for achieving true reconciliation in Australia. We need to diffuse that cultural awareness right throughout our communities, but then that allows us to begin that journey that journey that we've been on about creating a better, fairer, stronger Australia. But if we come now to our business imperatives, there are countless studies that we, we all are aware of, that we know, that have shown that diversity 
diversity of views, diversity of experiences, diversity of opinions is at the heart of strong and productive workplaces. So all of us in all of our different workplaces, and, and, and the university is of course one important example, we need to have that diversity, the diversity of views, the diversity of experiences, because if we are able to embrace that and acknowledge that and have those views around our leadership tables, we will make better decisions. They will be better informed decisions. And by, by building that into the way in which we do things, I think we will progress uh, in, into the future as a stronger university, but that will be mirrored across all organisations, all sectors in Australia, which will have a great, a great uh, set of outcomes for Australia more broadly. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. And I'm talking about how that works for us as staff members here in the university, but also how it links to reconciliation and our efforts here within the university. And I think you said that in one of the earlier responses too about our reconciliation action plan. Craig, from where you sit in NAATSIS, looking at courses like this course, the um, core learning program, how do you see that working towards broader reconciliation um, it, within organisations, but also within Australia? Uh, so that's a really important question and, and thanks for asking it because um, at the end of the day, uh, we, we work in organisations, but we live in a country. Um, well, actually we live in a society, don't we? And so one of the things that animates us at IATSIS as part of our core mission is to shape our national narrative. So to ask us is what is the story that, that we as a country tell ourselves about ourselves and what do we tell the world about that? And for much of our history uh, or the last 250 years, there's been a fairly narrow kind of narrative that we've had about ourselves. Um, and, and largely Indigenous people have been on the periphery of that. So we've not just been pushed to the fringes of our towns and cities and so forth historically, but I think also in how Australia imagines itself, um, we've been on the fringes of that. And so uh, programs like the core program that, that, that you have, and, and, and I should emphasise that it's really a springboard it's not the sum total um, of a program, but it's a, an important foundation um, for, uh, for each of us to do our own then kind of work and use it as a, a springboard or a launching pad. These programs are really important because they, they shape the way we think about ourselves and they shape the way we then, uh, in, thinking, in, in thinking about ourselves, engage with other people. And so ultimately, we are going to be a richer country uh, a more sophisticated country uh, because uh, of uh, a greater awareness and understanding and knowledge, uh, certainly of first Australians and our cultures and our, our history. Um, if you were to imagine the history of Australia, the timeline of Australia drawn out on a 10 centimetre rule, um, the period of time from 1788 to now represents about uh, three millimetres of a 10 centimetre rule. Um, and so how much richer a country will we be when we're able to draw on the full 65,000 year history of this country uh, to, to, to access, access the knowledge and the insights and the wisdom that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities hold, and not just as a historical curiosity, but as a way of living in the world that we live in now. And if COVID-19 has taught us anything, is that about the time you have everything worked out, as we thought we did since about the late 70s to now, in, it can be all undone, uh, unraveled by uh, a, a virus in uh, six months. And so we need to have access to sources of wisdom and insight and understanding that go beyond what we know. And uh, so, uh, Cultural competence work um, is more than about just acquiring the 10, the 10 rules for working with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. Um, it's actually about understanding, uh, understanding more, being able to look at things in different ways, being able to understand ourselves and then help uh, and then together create a better country to live in. So, so if reconciliation is about transforming Australia into 
the kind of country we know we all want to live in, then these, these programs are critical to that. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I'll just uh, move to Debbie and just say, just pulling that back to our reconciliation plan, if you just talk a little bit about that then around us going forward now with that plan and with the training and how they complement one another. Hmm. No, I think uh, Craig's articulated it very well. Uh, these courses, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a foundation, it's a launching pad, it's, it's, it's the beginning in a sense. And um, I would see all of us, all Australians, really our, our learning journey around a cultural understanding and cultural awareness and cultural capabilities, a lifelong journey. But uh, these foundation programs like CORE are absolutely critical. We will not move towards reconciliation uh, as a country, we will not be able to um, fulfil all of the commitments we've made in our reconciliation action plan unless we build understanding, genuine understanding, unless we build empathy, unless we develop that sense of connection, which was referred to in, in the earlier vid video. Those things are absolutely critical they then in turn engender respect and those in respect is absolutely critical on the path to reconciliation, understanding, connection. We've got to understand that those things are necessary if we are going to be successful in implementing what are uh, very important commitments that we've made in our reconciliation action plan. So for, for the University of Queensland, uh, this is a very important uh, launch and it's uh, I'm delighted that uh, we are uh, going to have make available the core program to all of our our board community it is a great program uh, but it is it is the foundation and the launching pad for what I would see for all of our community ongoing learning in this very important area so thank you Craig and Debbie for your considered uh, responses to the questions and your and your reflective um, thoughts around the training um, and where it's come from, but also now the impact that it can go on to have, not just here within the University of Queensland, but also more broadly with our partners and our uh, um, organisations that we work with in community. I'm now going to open up to the dialogue and we'll have some questions. So are you ready, Debbie and Craig? Debbie, Curtin University has an Elevate wrap. What lessons and things can UQ learn from your experience there? It's a it's a very uh, a good good question, and I would certainly be uh, you know very very keen, uh, obviously for UQ uh, to move uh, obviously to that level of of uh, the reconciliation action plan process, but it is about. Uh, embedding the absolute commitment to reconciliation in everything that we do. Um, so I was delighted uh, when I arrived at UQ to see the uh, Reconciliation Action Plan, to see um, the, the, the commitment under not only Bronwyn's leadership, because it's got to be uh, something that all, all of our leaders are absolutely committed to, and, and they are, and, but uh, what we've got to do is to um, ensure that it is a priority uh, for all of us uh, to ensure that uh, we do uh, absolutely implement all of those commitments that we've made. And I think, I think what I uh, inherited when I, when I um, uh, went to Curtin University and how I left it was that these things were top of mind, absolutely top of mind. And, and I think uh, we, we will be able to achieve that here at UQ as well. Bring it on, right? Bring it on, everyone. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Tanya, for that question. We got any further questions coming through? 